Manabesh, uh, how, how are you doing today? I'm very well. I'm very well. Thank you. All right. Uh, so Manabesh, here's, uh, here's how this is going to work. First, first of all, thank you very much sure. for doing this. Uh, you, my understanding is you're an options trader. That's right. And you've been doing it pretty much all your life. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Handling institutional desk with millions of dollars of exposure. Is it right? Yeah. Okay. That's Very right. Cool. So yeah. let's, I think let's start, let's kick off this session by doing a small round of introduction. Like I want to know, uh, I want you to introduce yourself to the audience uh, in sure. terms of your educational background and what you, what you do for a living. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you very much for for having me. I mean, it's it's an honor for to be featuring in one of your you know sort of guest lists, given the massive uh, following that you have, you know, across all the courses and how well regarded Fintry courses are. I think it's great to 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 sort of you know speak about markets and careers in general. Um, that could potentially impact, you know, many decisions of many young students and uh, careers, even, um, you know, mid-career professionals. Uh, so I'm, yeah, pretty, I'm looking forward to the chat here. Um, yeah, how, how I sort of, you know, just, just to give you a brief background of myself. I mean, my journey has been pretty, pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I got through an international scholarship after my 12th class exams uh, in India, uh, and I came here to Singapore to study um, my university, which was, uh, was primarily engineering. That's right. I have done my graduation in Singapore. Um, so I completed my university education here in primarily in engineering. Um, and uh, it was it was interesting. You know, first year was was fun, uh, you know, with new friends and overseas life. Yeah. And uh, then I sort of entered into sort of exploring various fields on my own, actually, uh, in my I remember in my second year, I wanted to be a professor. <laughs> I was just fascinated by, you know, uh, a few things, uh, you know, uh, when, I, when I saw different professors lecturing on different courses. Um, in my third year, I wanted to be a research scientist. I happened to have uh, many coffee sessions with many of the sort of PhD students and, and postdoc students and research scientists um, during that, I remember. And I realized that it's 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 it was one of those fields where, if you're if you're outside you wanted to get in and if you're inside you wanted to get out so mm. i realized it's 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 that's, not for me that's with a lot of things in life isn't it yeah perhaps actually uh, if you think about it um then in my um, fourth year uh, i realized i wanted to be a trader um i took up some business finance courses and um, and you know fortunately uh, i had an environment where i could um see my seniors you know entering the space and and becoming successful so so as a young guy um uh, i mean i would say i went through many conflicting thought processes of what i really want to be and thankfully um the fact that you know i wanted to be a trader really stuck to me and and uh, which i to be in all honesty enjoy till today so i totally sympathize you know all the sessions that you're doing right now because i have been in the same sort of mindset uh, where you don't know what you want in life and i think people really should continue exploring and and seeking out talking to various various uh, fields people professionals from various fields to figure out what they want and i think yeah i mean that's that's how i pretty much ended up on the trading desk uh, right after my engineering um, I didn't have an MBA. I straight away ended up at the options trading desk at BNP Paribas. So I was given the that responsibility. Was Singapore, for, Singapore itself. That was in Singapore itself. Where are you from um, originally? Originally, I'm from, from India, Orissa, India. Uh, and yeah, my pretty much all my career, I've worked in Singapore and Hong Kong. So yeah, that, that's how I ended up on the on the trading desk. And uh, there, you know, haven't looked back since, basically. You know, that's a very inspiring story because that, that's a paradigm shift from moving from Orissa to Singapore for, for graduation uh, and then getting a break. In fact, first discovering that you would like to be an option trader because, you know, when I was at that age, I was confused, you know, all over the place. I was trying 10 different things. So having that clarity of thought, how did you uh, figure out that option trading is what, what it's for me, especially a fourth year engineering student? I wouldn't really say that I wanted to be an options trader. I just wanted to be 
um, you know, trader doing basically uh, trading any asset class. But uh, in my fourth year, I, I stumbled upon a few interesting books, you know, Market Wizards uh, is, is one of them. And uh, it, it, you know, the book interviews people, traders from various walks of life uh, for, you know, very successful traders um, over the last sort of 30, 40 years. And um, I found one thing I realized was that the sort of personality that you need for being a trader is not very well defined. Typically, anyone can be a trader. You know, there are stories of successful traders who have been sort of taxi drivers in their past past life. And also the fact that I was exposed to some um, sort of seniors who were in in investment banking already uh, and also... Um, you know, the fact that I was taking some business courses gave me that sort of slight edge, I would say, to 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 understand that, okay, banking life looks more interesting. Um, and, uh, and actually, I watched a lot of videos. I read a lot of books to familiarize myself. Uh, I remember one of my interview, uh, in one of my interview sessions, um, you know, after the general sort of chat, I think towards third or fourth round, um, the interview gave me a book an options trading book and said, you have two days to study it. And I could ask you anything from this book. Mm. So I took that as a challenge and, uh, you know, luckily I cracked it, but, uh, but I must say that uh, there is a bit of luck involved and also a lot of exploring exploration by myself. A lot of studying, a lot of uh, talking to people. Um, So yeah, a bit of all of that. It's been how many years you've been trading options? So I started, I graduated uh, 06. So I started pretty much 07, uh, yeah, almost 15 years. And how, how has been the experience so far? Ups and downs, absolutely. I mean, you know, we can we can get to that shortly. But I think that I realized that I, I would always be involved in trading one way or the other, uh, given, uh, okay, I've like, in my career, I have moved through various like products and uh, responsibilities and book sizes and and all that PL target sizes. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm still doing the basics, you know, watching markets and trying to figure out what to do. And there have been ups and downs, and it's just a part of part of trading. I think um, the fact that a lot of people talk about, oh, you need to be super good in maths or 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 super, super sharp in your quant uh, abilities, I think. Um, some of that is actually overrated, having been mm-hmm. in the space for this long. Okay. Um, I think that just a rash rationality in mindset is mm-hmm. is probably the most important important aspect, which um, which honestly can't 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 be taught in books. Uh, yes, you need that little bit of knowledge, but I think in the commercial media and in books and in, in, and everywhere else, um, they kind of overplay the fact that you need to be super sharp in, in, in maths and stuff. I mean, I was, I was decent in maths, uh, but that, that could just be a correlation. It's, it's not necessarily a causation that, mm-hmm. that led me to a, to a trading job. So what, what skills do you, do you think it's more of a, uh the characteristics of an individual like the personality or behavioral traits uh, do you think that's more important in the trading world i i absolutely think so i think you need to, basically you need to have a framework where you understand yourself i think that is the biggest trait that a trader can have being self aware you know being sort of rational not sort of uh, running away from mistakes you know, showing up your hand and completely admitting that you have you've done something really wrong, and understand what I call you know the process versus outcome approach. I mean, mm-hmm. you do your process that has worked for you in the past. Everything in this space is probabilistic. You know, there's there's nothing deterministic in this world. Um, you cannot focus on outcome. I mean, because it does not lead to actionable results. I think. Focusing on process um, and being true to yourself, mm-hmm. not overestimating or underestimating yourself is important. Like sometimes people people overestimate themselves at market highs and underestimate themselves at market lows, mm-hmm. and uh, and those are 
excellent turning points so watching your how how you behave in the market i think um, you know uh, if i if i if i were to draw a parallel to cfl level 3 i think um behavioral finance plays a massive role in 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 trading uh, when you're actually handling capital you know studying about handling capital and and actually handling capital that's where behavioral finance comes in for example i mean i've been an options market maker and risk taker um, in my career and you know for example when you're market making um, you know market making institutions you know hedge funds prop traders um and let's say you know you you, you make a price 20 or 22 20 bid 22 offer and and let's say a client comes and gives you a 20 hmm. your your um, your core view is you want to be short the market but you have just been given a 20 and the next price is uh, 16 or 18 like almost instantly before you even had a chance to hedge it so many many sort of uh, you know there can be many approaches if you are too anchored what i call anchoring by yes if you're mm-hmm. too anchored to the price of 20 where you got given uh that's against your core view you want to be short but you're long now do you want to wait for the price to go up a little bit before you square mm-hmm. or do you you know do you realize no this is i want to be disciplined my view is to be short i want to take a loss of 3 dollars and get out at 17 or 16 or whatever and you know i want to maintain my book in a, in a certain way right if you were greedy and you want to wait for the price to go back to 20 where you have been anchored now because that's where you last traded you could be looking at uh, i don't know a 20% drop and then you've just lost a lot of money there's no signs that will tell you okay this is what you should do but you have to recognize yourself like what is your core view where are you are you suffering from any bias you know um one thing when i saw a lot of uh, the sort of interviews that you have had with other other uh, professionals uh, a lot of people talk about the fact that market timing does not matter you know hmm. because they have been kind of long term equity investors and um they don't talk about market timing they mostly you know in indian space is a lot of talk of equity markets more focus on mm-hmm. equities so it's a more long term wealth accumulation play uh, in our world timing is everything hmm. like i don't care hmm. what your view is long or short you have to tell me when mm. right uh, if if you're bullish tell me give me a time stop like tell me when is this going to happen because you can say you're bullish but price can go up and down and you can be right or wrong but it doesn't really add value so um so i think in in our space like in 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 fast money space um i'm not saying algo trading which is like super fast money but in you know general day to day daily week even weekly um a lot of research you know uh, sort of uh, strategists uh, do mention time stops price stop and a time stop in their view at what price and at what time is their view inv- invalidated so mm. timing is 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 everything in our, in our market and i think that um yeah i think uh, sort of w- one thing i think is which is very important i would say like for young guys who are watching this video to 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 take away from is whenever you guys are making a decision in life no matter what doesn't have to relate to professional decision but decisions that generally affect your your lifestyle you know uh, i would say write them down so start journaling from now for every major decision you make and write down what your thought process is while making the decision mm. because a lot of the times uh, like 2 3 years later you will look at those decisions and you will reflect okay this was what my i was thinking at that point and this is the decision i made and you you ask yourself why you made that decision the the whole process makes you much smarter because um, you you realize whether you were stupid you realize whether you were smart i think ray dalio talks a lot about it in his book you mm-hmm. know where he talks about self reflection um it it doesn't necessarily mean that you dwell into the past i think it's it's kind of misunderstood but self reflection the the knowledge that you get from self reflection is more than the knowledge that you can get from any book or any mentor or or anyone i mean in trading especially it's much more valid because every decision you make theoretically should be independent of the last and uh, 
since these are discrete decisions you know what sort of how, what is your thought process whether you are taking profits too quickly whether you are being emotional uh, while making a decision um whether you did not consider um the whole framework while making a decision whether you were being too too shy of pulling the trigger you've done the research and everything but you were just too scared of pulling a trigger because you're just overwhelmed with the with the pnl and the money uh, that's at stake you know uh, or you could be uh, sort of taking profits too quickly and and running losses too too far uh, you could be i don't know you could be suffering from fomo uh, where you get get into the absolute worst level uh, listening f- listening to hot tips from your friends and family and uh, you know yes. and and trading so lots of things you know lots of lots and lots of things that you can learn from yourself I'm your own behavior listing out all the things that i have done myself <laughs> yeah we we have all been there i mean <laughs> i have done that myself as well uh, but but while doing that i think if you if you can sort of force if you can sort of while it's happening if you can sort of watch your action while it's happening i think that that itself is a is a great learning in itself yeah. so i think generally speaking uh for for yeah for for young professionals they sh- they should see that you know journaling i would say is is very important even even i'd say for very for starting role in hedge funds if you say that you have journaled all the decisions in your life i would say a lot of people will be impressed uh, because it defines your personality um and i think that plays a big role uh, going forward so manish how so you know it's i'm so glad you brought up this point uh, point because it's in i think it's an underappreciated a uh, magic trick of sorts i like i've been journaling since i was in school uh okay. i i learned that uh, from my mother and uh, mm-hmm. i've been i think i have my journals starting when i was 14 year old or so when i look back and i read it gives me a lot of insight in terms of how i used to think then uh, you know the good things and the bad things yeah uh, and i've also been journaling uh all the investment decisions that i make this is a recent thing i started about 2 to 1 and a half years back mm. uh, but one thing i figured is that a lot of times you commit yourself to a decision right and then a uh, couple of years go by and then you ask yourself why did i do it in the first place and you don't remember that's right? so one of the yeah. cool cool thing with journaling investment decisions that has helped me is to kind of build my own thought process you know in terms of how i could think in a not so smart way and then next time when you take decisions you are a little bit alert about it yeah exactly i think uh, we also while journaling i think one thing that usually we should watch out for is are we doing a lot of system one thinking you know which is which is basically uh, which is too obvious uh, at that point of time when you're when you're when you're journaling so i have okay. generally seen that system one thinking which is the obvious consensus while you are while you are uh, journaling mm-hmm. over the long term does not really work um so you have to uh, of course depends on the time frame but but can you uh, elaborate a little bit on system 1 like i i i don't get it completely so uh, i'd say very vaguely speaking i think system 1 is basically just jumping on a market consensus that people are talking about and and typically speaking typically speaking if you hear if you hear about a trade idea from someone else it's likely that it's already at the 40 50% stage it's already played out 40 to 50% so really you have to ask yourself the fact that i'm hearing it even in media if you hear it mm. like cnbc or something then it's probably over it's time to go the other way mm. <laughs> um, but you know charlie munger said in his book that if you have a view right on anything have such a strong conviction that you should be able to explain the opposite view better than anybody else and if mm. you can do that then say that you're fairly confident in your view so let's say you want to buy xyz currency and you are you're coming up with all sort of macro reasoning of okay fiscal monetary uh, stimulus or growth trajectory um um you know, import export trajectory you, you come up with all these decisions and then you ask yourself okay under what circumstances i can be wrong and then you list them down 1 2 3 and then you really ask yourself like are these going to play out and if you can convince yourself that 
the answer is no then it's 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 not really a straight long or short answer it's just because at the end of the day it's probabilistic like you can mm. be dead wrong no matter how much you have analyzed but all you can do is you can um you can put your thought process in a framework like for example for for global macro so i have been focusing lately a lot on global macro i i was initially focusing on mostly market making clients and and right now i'm mostly focusing on global macro so global macro you can have a lot of sort of four quadrants you know check all um you can have goldilocks you can have reflation can you sorry can you can you explain yeah. uh, what global macro as a strategy or a desk would be so global macro basically means that uh, you are not uh, restricted to any particular instrument um you are expressing your global macro economic view uh and you are trying to find the best uh product to express your view for example if i saw that covid would be happening if i if i if i thought that okay covid is happening and central banks would come and come and uh backstop like you know the the whole financial system you ask yourself what is a better trade is is buying bonds a better trade or buying equities and at initially at the first point buying bonds was a better trade because there is no way that central banks would not cut rates uh give if there's a massive crash in the uh financial system mm. so bonds would rally first before equities bottom out and rally so there's a lot of uh nuances in in global macro um right now the global macro for example when i say is you see sometimes i think people complicate it but it's very very simple mm-hmm. qt quantitative tightening is going on and that is bearish period you don't need to do anything else right we are in a bear market because qt is happening we were in a bull market from 2010 to 2020 because qe was happening i mean for like 80% of the time and people try to um sometimes um play the like bottom up approach too much mm-hmm. you know sometimes they're buying not so great companies but is rallying 300% and they think they're stars but really the 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 forces in play are the macro forces which were in play for the last 10 years so all the long only strategies have worked well that's why indian in indian equity space the aum is so much because markets have only gone up what if in the next 10 years we go back to the 1970s era we have not seen inflation in the last 20 to 30 years in 19 from 1970 to 1980 was kind of a bear market hmm. i think nobody i think a lot of people will be very angry or unhappy to see a 10 year bear market because nobody has actually seen that and and i generally feel that um a global macro is kind of running the show and then okay if things are bullish then you look to pick the best 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 you know whatever commodity or best equity um, so i think that when i say global macro i i mean overall the direction of cent- money supply was the overall direction of uh, global gdp overall overall direction of global inflation and consumer confidence and based on that i make i may make decisions in buying vix or or um, or selling treasury bonds or buying gold calls or mm-hmm. you know buying dollar yen calls um or putting on vol curve steepeners in some of the pairs uh, so so global macro is very basically connecting all the dots and and saying okay this is what's happening in the big picture so you can say okay indian equity market you know um central banks are going to raise rates there's no sign of inflation coming down um it's going to be they're going to be raising rates into a slowdown which is bearish and now so that's the what i call the uh, the base case bearish and then you look for what are the best short plays in it then you start going i mean it's a simple top down approach but i just generally think that bottom up approach is uh, is a little overhyped mm-hmm. and and uh, and i think it's my view that top down approach is really what's calling the shots um uh, you know unless you are of course a long shot guy or you are 
you are a relative value per macro trader but uh, but we are in excellent trading markets where the macro conditions are changing uh, central banks are tightening um, and i think you know you really need to um, sort of be ahead of the game by watching so many so many asset classes like bitcoin for example front runs a lot of other asset classes in terms of predicting inflation Mm. um and um com- uh, commodities that's right yeah even even uh, even uh, copper copper yeah. is a is a good um well bitcoin uh, base case is is still people are trying to understand because there's not enough data um mm-hmm. people are still trying to understand okay is it really an inflation hedge is it really a risky asset is it really a safe haven or is it somewhere in between is it a store of value sometimes they call it digital gold um sometimes it's highly correlated to nasdaq jury is out but i'm saying that when i say macro trading i mean you have to look at various asset classes and try to connect the dots uh, is the agricultural sector outperforming for example and what does that mean uh, this probably an inflation play it's it's not necessarily that company a or b has just uh, has just done well it's it's just the fact that inflation like food inflation is going up and generally there is a bid for resources for mining you know so so yeah i mean i i hope i've answered your question to what macro generally means yeah yeah absolutely so so you're saying that you you have the the bandwidth to be able to trade any asset class pretty much anywhere in the world to express your view yeah so in the inst- in the in the banking space i have been focusing on uh, fx options uh and i look at i mean we have all these correlations mapped out for example copper is correlated to aussie dollar um or or um, iron ore is correlated to what's happening in china you know china credit mm-hmm. um uh, for example oil is as you as you know oil is correlated to inr um or at least the correlation keeps changing um so i do ex- i have for most of my career i have expressed it in currencies uh, global currencies um but you know it can be for example aussie dollar has a very high correlation with two tens flattener you know on the us treasury curve um which is also related to whether there's quantitative tightening or quantitative easing so i feel everything is kind of related and mm-hmm. uh, i personally have not traded a lot of other instruments uh but um but i'll be i'll be i'll be venturing into a lot more variety very soon uh so i'm looking forward to that and this this you're doing for the, for the institution you're working in right not in the personal capacity that's right i'm doing mostly making decisions for the institute yeah for a while for a year or so i was in a kind of a prop desk family office where i was experimenting various things um and maybe in future you know it's something that i'm quite keen on hmm okay and right now uh, you're handling which desk for the institution so right now i'm handling both g10 and emerging market currency derivatives book um so yeah i mean so typically um you know in in i'll say in a derivatives book like i'll just maybe run through what we do uh, you know you have institutional clients you have real money you have hedge funds you have uh, private bankers your prop traders so options trading fx options trading is a 24 hour market mm-hmm. so i wake up early in the morning i i go to the office and hopefully i'm not too late because um you know you walk in and uh, you're taking the books from the new york guy who wants to go to the bar or or mm. go for dinner um it's a 24 hour market right so somebody needs to be watching the risk so i take the risk from him from the new york trader um and uh, and you know i start looking at the basically a typical day i start looking at the calendar and i go okay what's happening okay maybe rba is speaking in an hour um maybe japan inflation numbers are coming out in 30 minutes around 9 am uh singapore time um then that's when tokyo fixing also happens or 9 am tokyo time maybe new zealand confidence uh, numbers are coming up since i trade vol i have all these vol variances on my pricer mm-hmm. so i have like for rba i may have an extra 
extra variance because what he may be saying may lead to extra volatility. So when I'm bootstrapping the curve, the vol curve, mm-hmm. so I have an extra variance for today's event, let's say. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, then I walk in, I look at my PNL, and I have let's say I have paid 250k theta overnight, mm. which is a time decay, mm. uh, which means I'm long gamma right now. And mm. so I, my job is to make more than the 250k decay that I've paid last night. And I may have taken a conscious decision. I've gone long the RBA or the call it FOMC meeting. Uh, maybe FOMC is being priced in at a break even of, let's say, 10 vol, which is like half a percent. Mm-hmm. If I if I if I call if I if I'm talking about FX, let's say euro dollar, overnight vol is 10 percent, which is uh, uh, which is call it around uh, less than half a percent break even in terms of spot. How do you how do you measure so, the 10 percent? Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. So I have a couple of questions before I let you go further. Uh, when sure. you say I want to trade long vol. Uh, do you generally execute that with just building long options and hedging the other paths, or do you just play it on VIX? No, VIX is equity vol. So what hmm. I trade is OTC markets FX vol. So hmm. let's say I want to be long vol. I go to the broker and say, "Hey, where is one year trading?" So the guy will go, "Okay, one year is nine one at nine four. Mm-hmm. So I go, "Okay, I'll buy some at nine four. So that's basically. What is 9.4? 9.4 is annualized volatility of one year at the money straddle. With that, I'm buying in the market. Annualized vol of one year straddle. Yeah. Right. And sure. Measured, so I mean, and that measured in terms of percentage. The vol, yeah, it's 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 vol is me- measured in terms of percentage. Uh, I mean, for example, if I look at my book, I could be short one month, long two month, short mm. one week, long six month. Uh, yeah. short one year net long you know hmm. but say if my view is i want to be net long but i want to be short the front end long the back end hmm. um because i think that markets will quieten down so the front curve will go down faster in terms of fall hmm. and the long end will stay bid because hmm. i think i think that overall vol is okay but in the near term markets will will be range bound let's say hmm. okay. so i short one month and i buy six month Go vega ahead. neutral basis Hmm. So I go, okay, I'll sell one month, I'll buy six months on a Vega neutral basis. So, which means that if I short one month, which means I'm betting that, okay, in the near term, within the next month, markets will be quiet. So I don't hmm. want to be long options. I don't want to pay time decay. But overall, markets will again be volatile. You know, So people play the curve steepener and flattener that way. Right. And this so, you do with see, when OTC. You're, Sorry, I interrupted. So this you can achieve with uh, OTC trades. And what instruments do you typically use for this? OTC, yeah. Uh, OTC it's, options. It's OTC options. That's right. Okay. I mean, you can build a similar portfolio for exchange traded options. Uh, right. That's fine. But then, when you do these OTC options, uh, are you simultaneously hedging the other Greeks? Like, how do you eliminate your delta exposure? Yeah. So, a few things. So, when you're options trader, right, you have to really understand what are you trading. When you're trading options, you're trading always two things. One is the underlying asset. Mm-hmm. And if you're trading the underlying asset, which is spot or, or or equities, then you don't think of it in terms of vol. You just think, okay, this is a call I'm buying here. So this is my payoff. Play. Directional play. So you're directional, yeah. yeah. So you have to ask yourself, are you a directional, are you taking a directional bet or are you taking a vol bet? Right. If you're taking a vol bet, everything should be delta hedged at all times so when i am doing any trade in the market typically mm-hmm. so let's say i want to buy a six month 20 delta calls mm-hmm. i go to the broker and ask him okay where is six month 20 delta calls broker comes to me with a vol price i say mm-hmm. okay i'll buy the transaction is delta hedged by default in the market got it so in my portfolio it will show up as a vol uh, so I'm at any point of time, if I look at my snapshot, mm-hmm. um, I would be, if I'm a vol purist, I would be so delta the hedged. exposure is zero. Yes. More or less zero. And the, yes. And then spot moves, then I have a delta exposure because I have gamma. I have yes. vol, I have gamma and all that. So I have to hedge. So let's say in this example I gave you where I'm paying 250k time decay and, and mm-hmm. I'm long gamma, I'm basically... I'm hoping that market keeps moving a lot and I sell, buy, sell, buy, so I can make that 
money back within mm. within the day yeah um so i think students really understand in the books how call call profile you know put profile what's a seagull you know all that mm. but they don't understand the vol aspect of it and sometimes they confuse um vol with they're really thinking of it in direction but they also talk about it in vol which kind of makes doesn't make a lot of sense because if you're trading vol as an asset class you buy vol and you sell vol yeah. your bet is on the variance how much it moves not in the direction i mean f- in my books for example um vol market is not very liquid so for example if i am you see dollar yen has had a massive move up in the last uh, couple of months on the inflation story and if you're short if somebody came and paid you for top side dollar yen some client or hedge fund or institution it's very hard to source liquidity so i was maintaining a long spot bias against my short top side vol view because i know that there is no market if <laughs> it will just explode like i can't really go and pay an offer and hedge my position so i am running a delta position against my short vol exposure because delta is something that you can just execute in mm. the market is spot so you're saying you you were long delta and short vega at the same time at the same time yeah because i couldn't source the vega like i don't think there will be liquidity to buy the vega maybe it will cost a lot of money so i feel mm. that is the weak side of the market but i can't get my position see one thing on being a market maker is you don't have the positions you want you mm. you have the position that you're given Correct. and you have to risk manage but on the buy side of course if you if you can foresee that then you pay a spread you spend like 100k or something and then you turn the position around but it's not very realistic to be spending money and crossing spreads all the time because a market maker tries to capture the spreads in general that's a that's a typical day so, so this is you you brought us to a very interesting point where you said you know people when they trade options they don't distinguish between uh directional non directional trades but i think like what i've learned manabesh i i tried my hands at trading for a few years uh, uh early days when i when i kind of got exposed to markets uh, way back in 2006 around the same time uh, i figured there are few things that you learn only by doing right because i was studying for cfa and 100% know, at that time yeah. uh but when you read cfa books you feel like uh, you know just do a long call and you make unlimited profits <laughs> is it yeah. uh, but then yeah. there are few things that you learn when you start doing it and i'm sure you've been trained in an institutional setup so there's a lot of know how that must have been passed on correct so mm-hmm. because you started your option trading uh, working with an institution right away so someone someone who wants to start their career as an option trader and we get you know a lot of people coming to us saying i want i would like to be an option trader what what's your advice for them how do you how do you go about building this thought process yeah it's a, it's a tough one actually because you obviously you have to like uncertainty in in a lot of things uh, you have to embrace uncertainty as i mentioned earlier from a execution standpoint i think you can you know there's some resources which you can look at i i'm just not happy with the stuff that's out there that teaches options it's just as i said a uh, very theoretical like people know the payoffs but uh, the one and then the no black shoes equation and there's like it's it's a black box um mm. which is which is too much uh, to handle i think i mean I, i'd love to do i'd love to um, Uh, explain to people i mean maybe do a course or something in this space where i can simplify things but but yeah there are there are resources that are very close to reality if you have done some number crunching on say uh, risk neutral probabilities and and binomial models you 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 are sort of you sort of get an idea of the theory practical aspect i mean actually a lot of college kids right now they just open an account start trading and and see see how it goes i think it's a it's not a bad way to actually uh <laughs> learn um okay as long as you have very you know you know capital you're managing your risk yeah. <laughs> capital to burn or maybe you you'd start trading using a, using a test account um with the understanding that this is purely for learning purposes and then you see how how the pnl is moving how the greeks are changing what these numbers mean what should what is my break even 
what am i actually expecting when i'm putting this position so people can start opening i think uh, dummy accounts and put on some dummy positions and try to see how the how it evolves nothing beats that sort of learning in my opinion hmm. and yeah and you need to have some basic idea of you don't need to know what's in black shoals uh, like yeah that's exactly where i was going uh, but you not yeah i agree i mean you don't need to know black shoals at all to be a good option trader right and i genuinely believe it's more about personality uh, than anything else because i've seen some really successful option traders uh, who wouldn't know what you know what greeks are yes and they've made a lot of money they've been successful because they've built a system yeah but someone who you know who wants to do this professionally you know maybe try out for a couple of years do it on your own and then maybe try to be you know manabesh in a few years time i'm sure they would have to have understanding of uh, so one is you learn by doing uh but second yeah. if you if you're not studying parallelly you wouldn't have any idea of how you can probably do some trades on theta mm. right or you might do it but you wouldn't know that you're trading theta yes yes i think i think parallel as you said exactly i think what's out there the resources that are out there uh which explain you okay what is theta theta is highest at the strike or whether it goes mm. down you see that and then you look at your portfolio you have that option in yeah. you see how theta is you know as you move away from your strike theta is going lower and then you sort of realize okay this is this is what's happening you learn so much faster that way kind of both together uh, i strongly encourage people to open sort of dummy accounts and dummy positions and just plug 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 any strategy in there and see how it how it looks like hmm. um yeah. change the spot change the strike change the maturity and see how is your vega changing how is your pnl changing um uh, yeah i think that helps interesting okay so uh, someone uh, when i mean if someone wants to be an institutional option trader like you what do they need let's say there's a 20 year old kid watching us right now on youtube and uh, they want to try out their hands at institutional trading uh what steps should one take to reach where you've reached well as a 20 year old firstly you need to figure out that this is what you want so yeah. i strongly recommend like a couple of books one is uh, which i mentioned earlier market wizards hmm. and there's one book called predictably irrational uh i think that's a excellent predictably rational by dan ariely uh it's a it's 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 uh it's a good book and okay if you have time you can look at liar's poker which is like a mm. funny way of uh, 90s wall street mm. yeah uh of portrayal i mean that sort of builds interest when you see you know fascinating things like that but on a serious basis when you when you when you have made up your mind that you want to be a trader you still have to sort of do the do the hard work which is a little bit of number crunching you know maybe try creating a basic very basic model of of or any random process you know so you need that little bit of math knowledge to begin with so that at least in interviews you can you can say that i've tried this and i've tried that and generally speaking a lot of managers in in banks they at the very basic level they will ask you sort of technical questions but they also know that none of this actually matters yeah and um, and really they're trying to understand whether you can do your job and which i mean cfa if you have taken up cfa and you have pretty much demonstrated you can do it, you can you've got decent enough analytical skills to to be learning anything so they won't even ask you all these technical questions i think or at least i don't when i speak to people but, but on a graduate level like very graduate level 20 year old 19 year old then you need to do a little bit of excel uh, have try your uh, hand at a couple of uh, basic uh, risk parity model or model or anything um uh, because five years down the line you wouldn't even remember what you did mm-hmm. it's 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 interesting because the amount of your understanding goes from a lot more theoretical to a lot more practical as you build experience but as a newcomer you you still have to go through that so i think um i would suggest a read these books um 
just just read to develop the interest you know uh trading is a fascinating job there's no presentations there's no there's no um um sort of meetings you know it all happens on the desk you're sat on the desk for 15 hours a day uh drinking coffees and 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 talking to friends and everything happens on the desk like e- even i give market commentary on my desk um you know when london comes in and people all around the world hear what i have to say because it all happens on the box so all happens on the desk um it's it's very different uh the there are no there are no hidden kpis you know the kpi is your pnl yeah um it's as objective as it could possibly get yeah. that's um, one good thing so uh, it's just a number okay you can you can argue why the number should be should be a or b but over the long run the number should should look good for a successful career so that's why i'm saying like you can't bullshit your way up because at the end of the day you you have to show numbers so i think that's why i say understand yourself be true to yourself and pick up some basic technical skills which you can show to the interviewer that okay i did this uh, modeling um i made a couple of changes here and uh, i managed to sh- uh, show these kind of returns you know and if you can explain that and basics of options uh, is okay understanding basics of options okay but if you want to uh, is okay to to go through the trading um, interviewing process i would say just to enter but then to appreciate what you're actually doing is when you start actually doing it and and right now for retail people i mean there are so many avenues i mean when for example when i started i mean there wasn't any retail offering that could have options for example uh, so i all the numbers were just completely new to me uh, the the ones i was looking at uh, so i learned everything on the job but to get there to convince that you can learn on the job okay if you have a cfa that's great and i mean I, i'm sure many people in 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 the infantry already have have a decent understanding so i think uh, if fintry people are watching then i would say start doing a bit open dummy accounts and uh, figure out how your trading process looks like uh, because chances are interviewers can ask you okay have you done if you're so interested why didn't you open up a dummy account and mm. and try to and try to experiment so yeah that's interesting but amish i think you you're a safe charter holder now right that's right yeah uh, also farm yes So you're a CFA and a farm chart holder. Yeah, and you've yeah. done this in the last five six. Well, years? CFA, I have, I have uh, cleared three levels. I just haven't oh, yeah. haven't paid up. So I, I guess I, I can't call myself yeah, officially a yeah, chart holder. Let's take it back. <laughs> let's take yeah. it back. Right. But <laughs> yeah. you, you passed CFA three levels. You're a farm chart holder. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and you did this in the last five six years. Yes. When you were already an option trader. Yes. So, because. you know every time i talk to traders one of the thing or in fact uh, when people look at cfa program the perception is it's a program meant for people who want to build careers around fundamental analysis and that's a lot of orientation uh, of the program though it has derivatives and other stuff but the orientation is more on valuation long term investing do you think from a trader perspective uh doing these certifications have helped you and do they really help uh, personally being a good trader and also professionally in your organization mm, i would say not a direct one to one correlation because uh cfa helps you appreciate a wider spectrum of asset classes and economics and uh private equity and everything around you to help build your thoughts to form views which eventually you express using your trading job however um if you just look at the actual trading role in itself i would say neither cfn nor frm like sort of stand out okay if i if i were a risk professional you know i i know you spoke to one of the risk management guys mm-hmm. who only look at you know running um checking how much yeah. is the risk what are the risk limits um 
So as a trader, I'm also a risk manager, obviously. I mean, yeah. it, it, trading and risk management are not separate. But they are their job is there's a risk desk in the bank whose job is specifically to make sure all the traders are within the limits. And, you know, what if the delta limit is breached? What happens? You know, running all those scenario analysis. Um, so for them, FRM, I think, is 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 important because there's a lot of focus on Monte Carlo and and all that. For for trading, I, I don't I think both are equally sort of uh, important, but neither of them are like, okay, if you don't have that, you can't be a trader or not, nothing of that sort. I would say it just helps you understand various things, which you eventually you use um, in your in your careers. So uh, there's no direct one-to-one correlation. Even in, uh, in okay, so for example, when I was, uh, after I graduated, I had gotten the trading job and then I had a, offered to join uh, Carnegie Mellon University for financial mathematics. Uh, that was in 2008. Mm-hmm. And uh, back then we we didn't, back then a uh, crisis happened and they stopped giving loans. Mm. So I, I actually couldn't go. Mm. Um, but the course, when I look at, I mean, some of my colleagues who actually went there uh, because I was relying on a loan, um, but some of my colleagues who went there very mathematical focused they ended up in quant based jobs trading is not exactly quant based i mean for example on in our bank we have a separate quant desk who do all the complicated maths it's not trading trading is we making buying selling decisions so i think sometimes people confuse that you need to be very uh, thorough quant guy not necessarily for those guys uh, i think financial mathematics uh, matters FRM matters. For uh, CFA, I would say more buy side portfolio management, uh, more real money guys, uh, for example, BlackRock or um, you know mm-hmm. the likes of real money. For fast money, like hedge funds, less relevant. So I'd say the closest to trading is probably financial maths, followed by FRM, followed by CFA. But CFA gives you that holistic picture for forming a view at the first place. So you were saying it helped you learn and understand things better, but not necessarily uh, helped you in your career per se directly. No, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say directly. Like, for example, if I take up a CFA, I, I email my HR, hey, uh, you know, I have a CFA now. Should I get promoted? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it doesn't really, doesn't really work that way. But yeah, there are. I mean, there are a lot of roles. They just don't accept non as you said, you know, non-CFA candidates, especially on asset management side or real money, as I said, it mm. just, it's just a requirement. You can't even get through your resume. You, your resume can't get through even uh, if you don't have that. So of course, for those roles, it's important. Yeah. Uh, for trading, uh, the CFA is never a requirement mm. or or rather anything, any nothing is a requirement other than showcasing something that you have done in terms of maybe building a model or or showing that you've tried out uh, some strategy they can ask you about strategies hmm. uh, so trying out a strategy or trying to beat the market in one way or the other um, yeah. so i think the best way if 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 someone comes to me and says i would like to explore option trading i think they could probably get something like a john hull to read the theory and then start trading directly I think that that seems like the best possible. That's uh, that's decent enough. Enough. John Hull. A lot of things will be difficult to understand. Uh, I think, but still, it gives you a basic understanding. Uh, you don't need to really understand the derivation of put call parity mm. or um, or um, you know how vol surface bleeds over time mm. uh, or things like that. Uh, for example, in Bloomberg, you can simulate an option and you can change the time and you can see how the wall surface is moving yeah. and how it affects. So these things are much more available now for retail people to experiment and simulate and understand. So, yeah, I think a combination of what you mentioned is a good enough start. Got it. Now, one other, another constraint that uh, we see in India, right? All these institutions. So there are plenty of trading desks in India. I think uh, most of the investment banks, they're running some of the other trading desks here, mostly in Mumbai. Sure. I've seen. Uh, but there is a reluctance to recruit beyond IITs. 
what i have observed is the sweet spot for these guys the catchment areas they'll go to iits and pick up pick up freshers and then train them to be traders uh, so someone who's not from iits but wants to have a career here what do you do yeah i mean look one thing i uh, one interesting thing that i have observed in yes there are a lot of from indians indian space a lot of iits in the in, in the market especially um, and i am especially i am calcutta hmm. um a lot in in uh, in derivative trading um you know a big batch of people knowing each other uh, juniors and seniors yeah uh, there's a big cohort out there um, but i have noticed that a lot of successful traders are from not the harvards and wartons but the slight tier 2s uh then i was thinking like why is that the case you know for example if you have been an absolute superstar all your career you've uh, you've 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 cracked everything and you end up in harvard or wharton which are arguably uh, the top 2 um in my opinion um but they end up in private equity or consulting or or something else not necessarily trading mm. and then i i kind of like i was kind of thinking that part of the reason could be because you cannot think too highly of yourself to be in the space you have to be grounded and you have to be rational as i said so i have seen i mean my boss and his boss they're they're all from normal universities in india especially it's a bit skewed i i don't know why yes there are smart people out of iit but there are also smart people outside we don't necessarily for example in our our organization or even the ones we were in we were not necessarily filtering candidates just on mm. iits but i think uh, as i said you need to work a ex- little extra harder for for getting through to the interview stage and that is by showing some project work which is un- unfortunately slightly easier for the one who has a better degree but that's that's life and you know uh, but i'm saying like once you get in uh, there's absolutely uh, assuming you have you know an average level average to above average level of intelligence you you know an iit has, has no edge over a non iit and i would say once you're in the space so hmm. the challenge is to get in just the entry barrier that's right or right, manavish this question i wanted to ask you <clears throat> sure remember we we had a conversation i think a few weeks ago uh, i think evening hours and when we discussed uh, we do this thing together uh so since then i've been having this question in my mind i thought i'll ask you this so you you were already a, a you know an expert in derivatives before you signed up for cf and frm program uh how did you find uh, the depth and the rigor of derivatives uh, in both cf and frm did you find it it was reasonably good uh, that someone can cover the whole at least the theoretical ecosystem or do you feel that uh, the syllabus was inadequate i think it was a decent shot um, overall um, frm i don't really recall but i think in cfa level 2 you know the binomial pricing model i mean i'm quite surprised in cfa they started talking about vol swaps yeah. which uh, which is very which which pleasantly surprised me uh, but that's 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 great and i th- i think the it's it's dec- there's a decent shot at at understanding the derivative side of it uh, in the options i think again um, it's more understanding of the directional how you can play directions like you can yeah. study cfa you can go and start taking directional bets very easy it's not that difficult but once you start uh, focusing on the vol side of it that's when the Mm-hmm. interesting part starts and i don't think the curriculum is enough or a lot of the books and that's where maybe hall comes in and explains you a lot of other stuff uh, yeah risk reversals good, butterflies good stuff, yeah. smile yeah hall is decent for that so so yeah i think part some parts are good and some parts are are lacking okay all right interesting good uh, any other final word of advice for all the listeners uh, how to be a hot shot uh, option trader out of singapore there's no shortcut i mean there's no uh, i i run away when people say uh, a hot shot and stuff like that i mean as i said be extremely grounded in life and you you know trading gives you the highs and lows of emotions that you can that that a complete 
quickly can damage your emotional state if you're not true to yourself so i think do the hard work talk to people network uh and and just just uh, even in a tr- in trading interviews be very honest and say hey you know i i am just really interested at this i have tried my best given the resources i have had you know how does this model look like you know i would love to learn, learn more about this people will appreciate how much passion you have shown in 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 something um and uh, at at all levels uh, passion is all that matters and um, you, as i said you can't really lie your way through a trading job it just does not work that way even if you do you'll be fired within less than 2 months i mean they have heard heard so many cases so watch these uh, motivational i would say not motivational but watch the uh, study these books and uh, and uh, there's a lot of noise in youtube right now about obviously there are people who are trying to sell their stuff you know showing ferraris and showing uh, mm. all these fancy houses again these are all you know, run run far away when you see all this stuff trading is hard work it's really hard work every day you come in you try to do your best next day you come in you try to do your best it's as simple as that it's just same set of processes repeatedly over and over and over again there's no shortcut at all and experience teaches you but until you get that experience i think just be extremely passionate about the role and talk to people and that's how you get the passion you know when people tell you the stories successes and failures you you kind of have you kind of feel whether okay this is for you or not uh, there have been many smart people joining our trading and who have left in the in the first 6 months uh, because they realize it's not for them Uh, not saying they're not smart like extremely smart guys but just not for them they can't take the stress um so uh yeah i would say networking um read up find out more and more and as you mentioned for options especially um hall and and uh, and and um you know trying by learning by doing uh, helps all right manavish thank you very much i appreciate really appreciate you doing this and giving us giving us a valuable time that you have is this in uh, by the way do traders get off on weekends are you still yeah, yeah. your we strategies are... no that's that's pretty pretty uh, that's a good thing about our role mondays to fridays it's high octane saturday sunday markets are off and we are completely completely out to, uh, to relax yeah all right thank you very much thank you very much it was a pleasure